Hi guys, welcome to Learn Electronics Repair. I have a battery charger here for repair. This is a lithium iron lithium polymer battery charger because it says on the box, yeah. And that's about as much as I know, it says 58 volts. There's like a little mark here. Well, I'm not sure if it really is a little mark where it says 58 volts. This belongs to somebody who lives in a caravan or mobile home yeah. and uses solar power but apparently he really needs this thing fixing so we can have a look it has a well what I would call an XLR connector on one end of it and just mains power on the other end this is all loose so it's obviously been opened before on both ends so before I even try to plug this in I'm going to open it up and see what somebody might have done to it, yeah? I've removed the remaining screws. Oh, the top comes off. That's how we get into it. So, regardless of this being a battery charger or not, what we really have here is a switch mode power supply. Yeah, like an ATX. There's two capacitors. Are they 120 volts? Yeah, so, sorry, I meant 200 volts. Yes, they're a pair of 200 volts. And there's the large brown capacitor. If you watched my videos recently, why does an ATX have two capacitors? You will know from the existence of these and that and two output devices that this is a LLC bridge circuit. Okay, so it's very much like an ATX supply. This is the main output transformer. This one is either used for feedback of some sort, sending some sort of signal back, or it's some sort of standby supply. Let's have a look. Well, I only see one output, so that's down here. Okay, it says output and minus. So I think we can assume there is only one output. There's a current sense, that little loop thing there. So I think it's likely this is probably some sort of feedback. Yeah, we have a chip here which i will look up the port number if it doesn't be obliterated yeah and that is quite likely driving via this is like an atx sort of so yeah we have a chip here pulse width modulator we have two transistors here driving the primary of this transformer and the secondary drives the two output devices there we go guys that's what we have yeah within a few minutes this will be the uh, output diodes. Okay, so that's what we've got. Seeing as I have the lid off, I suppose I could just take some basic measurements on this first and then let's put some power in and see what it does or doesn't do. Okay, I'll get the test meter. I have the meter on continuity mode. I can see there's a fuse here in the actual socket the main socket there's a fuse there which i'm pretty sure we can say basically is between this metal strip here and the red wire or the black i don't have any continuity there but the meter isn't working oh huh. always check that yeah so from here the fuse hasn't gone There's no short across the mains. The fuse hasn't gone. That's the bridge rectifier. Bit awkward to get at. So because the fuse hasn't gone, I doubt there's any shorts in here. I can get to the legs on these transistors down here. We can have a quick look. But I honestly can't imagine there's a short unless something else is going to open circuit somewhere. Let's have a look. No, there's no short. I was just slipping off the legs of the component. No short. I don't think there's a short there. It's very difficult to get down here with the transformers in the way. No, that's okay. What's happening is there's a metal 
bar strapped here like part of the heat sinking and I was touching that when I was trying to measure the components that's why I was sometimes seeing continuity the problem if I power this up is the fact that I can't easily get to the other side of these capacitors so I can't see if it's storing a dangerous voltage this has been here since Friday and it's now Monday so it's been sitting here so I honestly do not believe there's any charge in this right now I can probably check that as well so if I go across the bridge rectifier you can see it there yeah the sloping edge will be the positive leg and I can get to it and if I can get to the negative leg no nah, I can't get across it if I could measure across it I could easily see okay so let's undo these screws in the side which is holding these output devices then we can take the PCB out and then we can have a good look what we have I have the PCB out now this uh, bolt just sheared off actually when I was trying to unscrew it this is where the head of the screw was or rather the head of the pin was not screw really before somebody mentions that yeah <laughs> So we have the PCB, we can make a few more checks now on this. I'm on volts range. These are clearly the two large capacitors here and here. And there's nothing in there, I didn't think there would be after so long. But should always check it. This is the output. We can check for shorts on the output. Obviously on resistance mode is the best place to do that. No, it's quite a high resistance. This is obviously a rectifier diode and I think these are rectifier diodes as well with these funny little condom things on them. <laughs> best way I can describe those. Ah, this is not a diode, this is U3, this is a voltage regulator. So this will be a Schottky diode, I would think. Coming from the main transformer, we can see there. But there is another supply of another diode here. Unless this one is like a crowbar circuit, it looks like it, we were talking about them. So negative end of the diode goes to the negative end of this capacitor. Yeah, that diode look. This is the output, yeah. And that's where that diode is, directly across the output. It's a very large one. That's a Zener diode. That's a crowbar circuit. Did you watch the video? I'll link it. But there you go. Perfect example. So, if this is a Zener, if I put the red lead to the negative, we should see it like a diode junction. Yeah, that's what you expect. This one is almost certainly a shock key diode. So this will have a lower voltage drop. No, it's actually about the same. Just a fast silicon rectifier. These are probably connected together. Yeah, so it's just like a double diode in one package. In fact, you can see actually, so why I think these two are connected together is because of the winding of the transformer, the secondary here. So I'm actually reading the low resistance there. And the diodes are actually wired this way. So from here, positive to here gives a diode junction and the same from that side but it doesn't really matter because as far as we're concerned to DC this could all be zero yeah. but that looks like a good diode to me okay so that's what we have one output voltage a couple of transistors down here driving the coil and this is the controller I see Let's power this up then and let's see. If I, right, no, let's do one other thing. Let's have a look at these output devices. Now I can get to them, okay? So, they're wired in series. I made the video with this. Why do we have the two capacitors? So we can have a bit of a look around here. So, this and this are the base or the gate for each one. I'd expect to see a diode junction from here to here. Yeah, and from the base to here, reads like a diode. This would read open or near to it. Okay, base to here, diode junction, base to here, diode junction. Okay, 
So that all looks okay. This goes to the primary of this transformer and then through a wind into the primary of that one. Look there. Yeah. Into this one, out of this one, into the other one. So this is the LLC circuit. This is one of the L inductor. This is the other one. And the C is that capacitor. These have a habit of failing as well. We can possibly check it in circuit, but we might have to take it out. Sometimes these go like very low capacitors and it doesn't work. On the previous one, I had one of these was open circuit. So it's probably just worth a quick check actually while we're here. Same previous one, it was an ATX. You'll notice with these, I don't always have like a set way of doing these things, guys. I just kind of like follow my nose depending on how I feel on a given day, yeah. So, negative to here, we should see a capacitance, yeah, 300. Uh, this one will probably connect to that one. Yeah, that's a negative of that one. About 300, so we know they are not open circuit like I had. And this capacitor across here, well, it should be somewhere up to about a microfarad. Let's have a look. Yeah, look at that, 960. That's without even looking at the markings, yeah. That's without looking at the markings. Guys, that's familiarity, yeah. So all that kind of looks okay on that side of things. Okay-ish, yeah. I'm thinking about this now. If this chip here drives those there, how does it power up? How does it start? Because there isn't a standby. Yeah. Let's have a look. Unless this doesn't drive that. But I don't think this is a standby supply. I really don't. Presence of these two transistors to start with. See another chip down here. I'm suspecting that's a dual off amp, some sort of comparator. I'm seeing some more diodes down here. Uh, for some reason. I think we'll have to first of all see if we can figure out what this is. And then we can figure out where it gets its power from. So look on the other side. Nothing. Okay. So The only thing that can obviously be driving these is that. But that needs power before it can drive them. Huh? You don't suppose the power for this effectively comes from the battery that you're charging. But then again, if the battery was completely flat, it wouldn't charge. Or if it was too flat, it wouldn't charge. But there again, is that some sort of safety device? So that if the battery voltage is too high, this is too low, this can't start. I don't know. I'm just surmising yeah let me get the microscope well guys straight away this is a tl494 upside down but it's still a tl494 and that is a pulse width modulator and that will be driving these two transistors and driving this coil to drive the power supply so the question is now where does this get its power from it needs power to start so in an ATX, you'll have a standby that puts the power on there, okay? We can find a data sheet for this. We can see where the power comes from. Now let's have a look on our board and see where that goes to. Ours is a Texas Instruments from the logo on it, so we'll use their data sheet. And let's see. We have a number of packages. Ours is the 16 pin. So one of these two. Ours is the TL493C. I'd say it's this one, but looks like the pinout's the same. Anyway, so the power comes on VCC. That's the power to the chip and ground on seven. So given the fact we know where the power comes from. And then there's the enable. So normally this is where the green wire on an ATX would come in and it grounds these two, E1 and E2, okay? This one effectively switches between a simple pulse width modulator and 
two outputs so they switch on and off alternately which is what we need for the LLC circuit I will definitely link the other video which I keep referring to if you didn't see it but if you did I hope this lot is making sense yeah because you've seen this before this is how you learn so pin 12 let's see where pin 12 goes to on our PCB and 7 for that matter so we can take a quick look we can see that we have pin 12 is here that's the power that goes past this capacitor by the loop sorry yeah it just goes past this capacitor down to here yeah don't think it goes under there at all anyway it goes down to this point and then that goes to pin 8 on this chip and this is LM358 which is exactly what I thought it would be dual op amp and that's the VCC so that's the power to this chip so these are getting power from somewhere so what I think we'll do is plug this in and have a look to see if we have any voltage on this pin yeah let's see if there's any voltage here first and if not then we'll have to figure out how this starts up I'll just check also that the ground on this chip which is pin 7 which actually would be pin 4 on this one yeah it goes to the ground here the minus out yeah so we know that's our reference point. So because we've actually taken just a little bit of time to familiarize ourselves with the circuit, when we measure this voltage, we know A, what to expect, maybe 12, 16 volts, five volts, we can look on the data sheet, but a positive voltage on there. And we know that if there is no voltage on here, it means that these chips are not running, so the main power supply isn't running, okay? I still haven't, or we haven't, since we're doing this together, figured out how this starts up yet, unless, some of you guys have and I'm a few steps behind yeah okay so let's power this up I'll just put something under it I prefer not to put high voltage devices directly onto my anti-static mat I mean I have done it never did any harm but I just do yeah old habits so let's see if it powers on, this LED should come on. I have found the user manual, I can show you guys, but it doesn't tell us very much. It doesn't say we need to have a battery attached before it will switch on, that's for sure. So, we have the power LED, and then this one is red or green, depending, red if it's charged, and green if it's charged. So this power LED should come on as well. Let's see what it does. I'll put the current limit on, just in case. Okay, voltage range because we want that and let's power it up and see what happens well the bulb flashed once and went out the green LED is on so this has power somehow I haven't figured out how yet so this actually has power so let's have a look 21 volts yeah so we have voltage there it's now gone away and if I measure across the bridge rectifier all these large capacitors, I can make sure that they have discharged as well. So this is actually powering up. That's the first thing. I'll just do it sideways. Across the bridge rectifier. Yeah, 60 volts and discharging. 50. So this is not going to hold a dangerous voltage for very long. So far, I'm at a loss to figure out how this starts up. Unless this really is a standby supply, but I don't, don't believe it. I'm just looking at the board. So this is the high voltage side over here. Okay. And do we have a gap? So this is your output diode. This is all your low voltage side. So down here, and effectively across and down here this isolates the high voltage to the low voltage and we only have the two transformers between the two to be quite honest is there something else here yeah that's a high voltage capacitor down there that's not unusual to find in fact actually it's not that one it's this one okay that's not unusual to find a high voltage capacitor across the two sides so <laughs> Either I've completely misunderstood how this works or I don't understand how it starts, but the point is it does start. 
There is actually something a little bit odd about this. So there are two LEDs, LED1 and LED2, and I'll just show you what it does in the user manual. So according to this, LED1, which is the red LED on here, is lit when the power is on. And it's not lit, like to say the power isn't on. The green LED is on if it's fully charged. This is basically a bicolor LED, it's red and green. So if it's charging, this is on red, and if it's fully charged, this is on green. Now, without a battery attached, assuming this kind of works by measuring the voltage across the battery terminals, which I think is the only way it can work, or it measures the current flow to the battery, which is the other way I imagine it could work. If there isn't a battery attached, you expect this probably would go green because there's no charge current. So it's like it isn't powered on, but it's saying it's fully charged. We know damn well the thing is powered on. It's not just like a faulty LED, is this, by any chance? I've had things brought in for stranger reasons than that, I will say. I'll just uh, unplug and check there's no voltage in this. Let's have a look. Yeah, there's very little voltage in it. Okay. Let's see if we can light the LED with the test meter on diode mode. Okay. No, I can't. I'd expect that to light, to be quite honest. That has fared well. One end goes to ground, and the other end comes up here. This you would assume is a resistor. Yeah. There's a resistor across here. And that goes up to the positive supply. So, from the positive supply, we have a connection to this resistor. And from the other end of the resistor, we have a connection to the LED. Okay. So, do we have any positive supply coming like this when it's switched on? Let's have a look. See what we've got. No, we don't have a positive supply coming out of it. So that's where there's something wrong with this, okay? There's no supply coming out of it. But we do have a supply to the chip, which is powering this, okay? And somehow, the supply voltage is going to this side. Mm hmm the next thing we should check then, and we know this from the data sheet, that pins 8 and 9 on this chip need to be low to enable it, okay? As I say, this is the same sort of chip you'd find in an ATX supply, and this is where the green wire goes to. So we'll switch it back on again. Let's have a look what we got on pins 8 and 9. Well, it looks like they're both connected together, as you'd expect them to be. And that is in fact low. Another thing worth checking actually is whether this chip is controlled by something to enable it. Or whether 9 and 10 are just connected directly to ground, which means that effectively it is always enabled. Let's have a look. So I'm just going to measure resistance from 9, 10 to ground. I'm not on continuity, so you won't even bleep, but let's have a look. Yeah, they connect directly to ground. I'll put the bleeper on. So this chip should be permanently enabled. It has power. Is it running? That's the question. Here is the data sheet again. I know this chip quite well. So pin 13 will switch the output between single-ended or double-ended. This will be double-ended, so we have two outputs. One is on C2 and the other one is on C1. Those are the actual outputs. We have a reference out on 14, so this is worth checking if there's no reference or the wrong voltage here. Because this is generated by the chip, it means the chip is dead, basically. We can just look down, here we go. So, maximum supply voltage is 41, we have 21, that's okay. 
What's on the reference pin? What should VREF be? Let's see if we can see it here. It just says VREF, so we need to have a look. Well, we can see here output voltage VREF. So this should be typically 5 volts, so we can check for 5 volts on VREF pin, which is pin... 14 so we'll check that should be 5 volts Here is the typical circuit so you can see this is how I basically Described it The E1 and E2 have to be connected to ground C1 and C2 are the outputs they have pull up resistors This is showing the VCC of 15 we have 21 but we know up to 41 is okay And the VREF is part of the error amplifier that effectively you compare the input voltage with the reference voltage. Okay, so that's what that is. It may well be using that dual op amp as part of that circuit, probably is. And that's about it. So the main thing we want to check now is, do we have five volts on pin 14? And if we do, then we probably be better using the oscilloscope and have a look to see if there's any output coming from this chip. Pin 14 then, so this is pin 14, looks like it goes to 13 actually, now comes down this way, let's have a look, so pin 14 is here, it's pin 13, yes it does, yes it goes there, and it goes here. Okay, so this end of this resistor is a very good place to probe for that. So we'll measure from here to ground, power it on obviously, and see if we have 5 volts. And we have 5 volts, so that is a good sign. The question is, is our chip oscillating? And really now, we should be using the oscilloscope, so let's have a look. To make life easier, let's see if we can find out where the outputs of these go to. So one of the outputs is on pin 8 according to the data she's in the one as pin 11 okay so pin 8 clearly goes this way to this resistor yeah specifically that one so we can measure on there and then 11 9 10 11 so that goes to the other one it goes somewhere i would think to the resistor I was just struggling a little bit to find out where pin 11 goes to, but I've got it now. So I'll just show you how this output control works and how I knew it was actually using both outputs, and then I'll show you where they actually go to. So here's the data sheet, and this is the output control function. So they're saying that if output control is set to VREF, connected to VREF, then we get pulse width modulation output at Q1 and Q2, so it's using both outputs. This steering input is only for the TL495, I have the 494. So it's a normal push-pull operation. This is firing each transistor in turn alternately, which you would with this type of circuit, this LLC circuit. So we can have a look on output control and see if it connects to VREF, which is actually right next to it. So we'll probably find these two pins are bridged together. And then the outputs are on 8 and 11, as we expected. And this drives the two transistor bases. So it'll probably go either via resistors or directly to the base of the transistors. Let's have a look. So continuity mode. Pins 13 and 14. 14, 13 do connect together. We measured that when we were looking for VREF, so we know that. So this is permanently in push-pull mode. One of the outputs is here, goes to a resistor, it also goes to the base of this transistor. And then the other one, I can't just kind of find the resistor at the moment, it's here somewhere, but it goes to the base of the other transistor. So these are driven in push-pull alternately. So we can look on the base of each of these to see if we have any drive coming out of our chip. Another thing, actually, I think is worth checking, because I couldn't just see where this resistor is, is that the base will have a pull-up resistor 
this is like an open collector design if you look on the data sheet it needs a pull up yeah and the pull up is either going to be on vcc to here or on the vref here okay so if we go to vref and we look on the base of this transistor in resistance mode we see 3.579k if we look at the other one we see the same, yeah, and to VCC, which was here, a capacitor charge is somewhere about 2.35, and they're both the same, so wherever that resistor is, obviously I just didn't find it, but it doesn't really matter, we know it must be there, yeah, so unless this thing has some problem to make me suspect that resistor, I won't really bother to hunt around to see where it is. Don't need to, yeah? Let's get the oscilloscope. As I'm not sure how this is effectively grounded, I mean, it should be isolated from the high voltage side, but I can't figure out how this starts up is the truth. So I'm gonna use my handheld scope. So let's power this up and let's have a look on the base of the transistor to see if this is actually oscillating or not, okay? So we'll power up. And yeah, I mean, it's not that clear on the sort of handheld scope, but I'm sure you can see that it's absolutely oscillating, okay? And the other one, it's oscillating, so that should be working. Why don't we have any output from it? Well, if I put my oscilloscope probe just next to the main transformer, we can see it's actually being driven at the same frequency without touching it, yeah? So according to that, everything should be working here. And yet I have no output voltage. Let's check again. Let's see. I definitely have no output voltage. I mean, there's no output on this, okay? But it seems to be working. I've just switched it back off again. So we know here is like a voltage regulator or something, U3. What's the MOSFET? Let's have a look what this actually is. It's a MOSFET of some sort. No, it's a voltage regulator 7812. That appears to be a positive voltage regulator. Rather strange prefix, but 7812 is a voltage regulator. So I'm going to see what we've got around this voltage regulator then. So we're on volts range ground now what's on the regulator so this will be the input 21 volts this should be ground this should be out 12 volts so we have 12 volts coming out of there but there's still nothing on this area of the circuit we have to ask them why this is not working because we have voltage around this voltage regulator this i think comes from this capacitor and these diodes by the loops of it we can probably tell actually this is the input pin and we have a bunch of diodes up here and just have a quick look yeah we have a connection into these diodes so these diodes here or driving this and then this diode we can see comes from the output of the transformer on this winding and then from the center pin which is the junction of the two diodes this is like a twin diode package so on the center pin that goes to this inductor comes back out here so that's so far so good and goes to the out and this is the smoothing capacitor okay There's no short across the output. Let's just check that capacitor. But if this capacitor is dead, you'd expect to get some DC voltage here anyway. Let's have a look. What size is it? It's all unplugged at the moment, by the way. 1000 microfarad 63 volt. So we can probably read this in circuit fairly well. Let's have a look. We're reading some capacitance. Bear in mind it's in circuit. So I'll just remove this and check it, okay?
There is our capacitor. How does it read? That reads fine out of circuit. That's good enough for me. So that isn't the problem. Let's put the capacitor back in and let's measure the AC voltage coming off this transformer. So that's the two outside legs of the diode. I mean, the diode measured okay in circuit at least. I'm on AC volts. We'll just switch on again. And let's see what we have here. So this is across the diode. And we have 23 volts there, AC. Okay, 23 volts AC. So what's coming out of the diode? Because we don't have any output. Yeah, and it's connected to here. So we can have a look. Output the diode. DC volts, nothing. That's why the diodes are open circuit, but they tested okay. That's the other supply, 21 volts. Nothing. How bizarre. That is strange. We know there's no short to ground. We've measured it anyway. Before. And now we think we're cracking up, yeah? So from here to ground no short. From this track to the centre pin of the diode, I have a connection. Let's take this diode out. But it did look okay. And we can double check it. Okay. Diode junction is there. Diode junction is there. Unless the diode junction is somewhere else. And strangely, I first said that I bet this is a shock key diode. It doesn't read like a shock key diode. But it may not be, eh? Uh, let's unsolve it. Put a bit of leaded solder on it. Okay. I mean, the only answer to this so far is that the diode's open circuit. We have 28 volts either side of it. And we have 28 volts AC. We can see that. And nothing coming out of it, but there's no short. And if there was a short, we wouldn't have 28 volts going in unless this is open. And there ain't a short. Let's have a look at it. Well, first of all, it is a double diode. You can see the symbol on it, yeah? Just catch a bit of light on it. You'll see it. Yeah, that's the first thing. Not a diode mode. Oh, yeah, this is working. We have an open circuit diode, guys. Double diode, open circuit, still warm. That kind of made sense in the end because the voltage readings wouldn't make any sense. Otherwise, I clearly had AC coming in and no DC going out and there's no short on the output. Let's have a look to see what this is and maybe this should be a shock key diode. Get the part number and let's have a look. So you can see MUR1660CT. Fairchild or Ferranti, that little symbol, the F. MUR1660CT, let's have a look. Let me have a look at my little stash of salvaged diode packages and let's see what I can find. Well, guys, I have some of these which I thought I could use. So this is the MUR1620CTR compared with the MUR1660CT. But you'll notice the problem with these is the R has the diodes reversed. You see the point in the opposite way? So although these test good, I can't use them. And I don't have any others. I only have some shock key diodes. I have this one. So this is a 20 amp 100 volt. 
Let's just check this. I think we can probably put one of these in just to test at least. Yeah, that means good. This is more like a shotty diode with a lower median okay, but I think we'll put this one in. We'll just see if it actually powers up. I don't want to run it under the load, but I'd like to see it work. If it works, I'll just get the correct part. I've put the diode in. We can measure this and circuit now before we power up. And we see from the end to here, wrong way round, let's go the other way round, from here to here, the diode junction, okay, and it's reading lower, okay, because this is like a shock diode from what I can see. I have the current limiter on, you can see the red light here, I'm really interested to know if does the light light up, okay, let's try it. And yes, yeah, straight away. So I'll switch it back off. I don't really need to run it. I know this is working. So I can order the correct part and we can fit that and then the guy can have this back. That's really interesting because this was reading like a diode, as though it was a good diode, even though it wasn't a good diode. And the question I have to ask, and I'm sure you guys want to know, is why? Because that fooled me, yeah? The only thing I did comment, oh, I thought it would be a shot key. That's all I said, yeah? And perhaps I should have thought more about it. But the only reason I can think possibly for that, we just go on to continuity mode. Okay. Is that this is the output from the transformer. And we have two sets of diodes. We have this one, which is the main output. And we have the ones which are down under here, which is for the other voltage rail, okay, which we know is there. And if we look across the secondary, so we have from here to here, obviously a winding, and through the winding to here, and to here, and to here. So effectively, these are all taps on the same winding, okay. And I think that somehow, when this one was open circuit via the winding, I'm, I'm actually reading the other diodes. <laughs> I'm actually reading that one, I'm reading this one, which is strapped across the output, but reverse biased, fair enough. So I think that's why I could actually see a diode junction when I clearly didn't have a diode junction. And that one, my friends, confused me. And did I go the long way around? I don't know, because in the end, I proved effectively that this diode cannot be working. It has AC coming in and nothing going out. So it wasn't like by chance I found that. That was definitely me working out how this works and working out where the problem is and effectively saying, okay, this must be duff. Take it out, it's duff, okay? So I hope you guys enjoyed that. That's the way it goes. I'm sure there will people be in the comments below saying, Rich, if you did it this way or that way, You'd have been quicker, and I'm sure you're right. But at the end of the day, as far as I see it, and especially when you're learning electronics repair, it's all about the journey. Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed that one, and I'll see you all very soon on another Learn Electronics Repair video. Ciao for now, guys.